All right, so this is our presentation on chapter 11, Solutions and Their Properties. So this is a, uh, like a bridge chapter between Chem 151 and 152. You'll see the same lecture in both, uh, both of my courses. Um, they're here, it's at the end of 151, and it'll also be at the beginning of 152 as, as sort of a bridge, depending on where you may have taken the course before. Uh, so what we're starting out with is a discussion of solutions energy changes for the solution process, concentration units, factors affecting solubility, physical behavior of solutions, colligative properties, vapor pressure, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, osmosis, osmotic pressure, uses of colligative properties, a little bit on fractional distillation, and this final FYI on the relationship between uh, colligative properties and kidney failure and other kind of health conditions related to that. Areas not to focus on. so. Again, drawing charts, graphs, and diagrams. I, I don't typically have those on my exams, but uh, I'm also not going to discuss anything in this chapter that touches on delta G, delta S, or delta H, since these are covered at other points in Chem 151 and 152. So let's look here at some key terms. So a mixture is any combination of two or more pure substances blending together some arbitrary proportion without chemically changing the individual substances themselves. So these can be homogeneous, with uniform mixing or heterogeneous with non-uniform mixing. A solution is a type of homogeneous mixture, and this is kind of where we're going to focus uh, most of our time. With particles in the 0.1 to 2 nanometer uh, diameter range, typically the size of ions or small molecules, these don't separate on standing, and they're often transparent or kind of lightly colored. Colloids are another type of homogeneous solution with larger particles in the 2 to 500 nanometer range. They don't separate upon standing, and they're often murky or opaque to light. Solute is the thing that's dissolved. Solvent is the thing that's doing the dissolving. Saturated is the point where the maximum amount of a, of a substance has been dissolved at a given temperature. Supersaturated is the point at which more than the maximum amount has been dissolved at a given temperature, and they'll be unstable and something will, will fall out. Sometimes it takes a disturbance to do that. Um, I'm going to step a little bit so you can, you can see just the text here for a moment, and I'll step back in if you need to pause and take a note. Miscible is a situation in which the solvent or solute are mutually soluble in each other in any proportion. Shouldn't have any other slides like that. We've we'll got a little extra there. Colligative properties are those properties of a solution that depend only on the amount of solute present, but not the chemical identity of that solute. And osmosis is where solvent molecules pass through some membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration to dilute the solute. And we'll see a little more about that later. So first we'll focus on this idea of solutions. We mentioned kind of what the definitions were a little bit before. Solutions are the most common class of homogeneous mixtures, and that's really where our focus is going to be here. Again, they have the smallest particle sizes, and they're homogeneous, which means that their particles are evenly dispersed throughout. We're going to consider the entire solution matrix, the entire substance of the solution, to be the same. To be the same. It has the concentration evenly dispersed throughout. You know, no, no solution is going to be perfectly evenly distributed throughout, but we're going to make that assumption mathematically, and it's going to turn out to be generally accurate across the board, as long as we fall into that category of substance. And they mention here, uh, they're not truly homogeneous, right, but these are examples of, um, sometimes they also call, uh, a, another group of these are sometimes called suspensions with even larger particles than colloids, and they do separa separate out eventually though. So, give us some examples of solutions. You can, you can use um, anything dissolved in anything um, with different phases to, to make this work. When you have a solution like this, you can have a gas and a gas, or gas and a liquid, or gas and a solid, but typically, Typically, the most common example we'll see are solids dissolved in liquids. That's the common example. Or maybe a gas dissolved in a liquid. But it is possible to have all these other varying varieties here and still be a solution, a homogeneous mixture with particles on the size that we discussed. So the dissolved substance is called the solute, and the solvent is the thing that does the dissolving. Is typically the liquid. So when a liquid is dissolved in another, the minor component is considered the solute, and the major component is considered the solvent. But solute and solvent are, are more about what actually happens. And when we talk a little more about the dissolving process, we'll see how the distinction between solute and solvent plays out in 
how that substance interacts with the other substance and what its role is in, in establishing a solution. So they say here, with the exemption of gas-gas mixtures such as air, different kinds of solutions listed involve condensed phases. So a condensed phase is another sort of term of art, which typically means a liquid or a solid or some interphasic that behaves more like a liquid or a solid than like a gas. So intermolecular forces are important to explain these mixtures because the, the particles, the solute and the solvent, interact with each other via intermolecular forces. The particles are attracted to each other or repelled from each other, and that establishes this process, right? The formation of a solution is established by solvent-solvent interactions, solvent-solute interactions, and solute-solute interactions. And we'll take a look at that in a little more detail. So in order for a solution to form, we have to somehow break up solvent-solvent interactions and solute-solute interactions and form new interactions between the solute and the solvent in order for the solute to dissolve into the solvent. And typically we're looking for like a like dissolves like. So in order for a solution to form, overall this process has to be energetically favorable. So when something doesn't dissolve in something else, when the solute doesn't dissolve in the solvent, it's because there's unfavorable intermolecular forces. These, this new relationship between the solute and the solvent is not as good or not even comparable to the previous relationship, right? If the gasoline doesn't want to dissolve in the water, it's because the water solvent solvent interactions are very, very strong and the solute solute interactions are not very strong, but the solute solvent interactions are really weak. So breaking these up is not in any way paid back for with new interactions. And so we don't see a lot of dissolving happen. That's another way to rationalize why things do or don't dissolve from a really basic standpoint. Going back to this like dissolve life, similar things, these, this new interaction will be comparable or maybe even a little better than the pre-existing interactions. And if that's true, then we can form a solution. Um, We'll talk about a concept called entropy later on in a Chem 152 course. And this will tell us how mixing things together is generally always favored kind of intrinsically um, from a thermodynamic standpoint. But it's prevented by intermolecular forces if they are very unfavorable compared to the starting forces. If they're, but if they're roughly equal in magnitude, then dissolving will happen. Um, but if they're a lot worse, then we won't have dissolving happen. So a nonpolar solvent can dissolve nonpolar solutes because their interaction forces are similar. A polar solvent can dissolve a, an ionic or a polar solute because they have similar interactions between them. And they show this how an ionic compound dissolves into water because of the similar forces, right? We've got charged ion particles here and the water is able to surround it by pointing its positive ends toward a negative ion and its negative ends toward a positive ion to perform a process called solvation, which is a physical process by which the solvent interacts with the solute and that interaction is what establishes a solution. There's got to be some kind of interaction, right? If there's no interaction, then we'll see layers or we'll see something fall to the bottom. We won't really establish a true solution where the solute becomes evenly dispersed throughout the solvent. So we can talk here again, we're not going to go into this in much detail, but we'll look at this idea of an enthalpy of solution, right? There's a certain amount of heat associated with this and a certain amount of, you know, ent uh, entropy, or we can think about this as a kind of disorder that's associated with the formation of a solution. But again, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. But the key point I want to bring up is that by dispersing something into something else, it's generally intrinsically favorable. That's the point that I'm, I'm making here by bringing this diagram in. That is generally intrinsically favorable. Unless intermolecular forces stop it, mixing occurs. Mixing is the, the thermodynamically driven outcome of two things encountering each other. So some things, so we talk about this enthalpy a little bit, but again, I'm not going to go into that much detail about what exactly this means for the purposes of this lecture. But to think about it this way, if we've got a positive enthalpy here, then we're going to have to put in some heat in order to make this work. And that might be sufficient, like at room temperature, that might be fine. If, if this is negative, then that means it's going to release heat when the solution forms. And that's all we really want to see here. It's actually okay, all these solutions can form as long as there's, it's warm enough to supply this, but all of them have 
positive entropy. So all of them increase the the randomness. All of them increase the the tendency toward energy dispersal inherent in mixing. So again, going back to these different types of interactions, right? We talked about the solvent solvent interactions. Those have to be broken in order to fit the solute in. So I've got to pay that cost in terms of heat or energy in some way. And I've got to break up the solute as well. I've got to pay an energy cost for that. And then I've got to form new interactions between the solute and the solvent. And the hope is that that pays it forward, pays back for these that I had that were positive. These, I had to, these costs I had to pay get paid by this formation. Okay, or they're roughly the same so that this can be zero, approximately zero, and then the overall natural tendency of mixing will, will drive this process. But if this interaction is a lot worse and can't pay for these breakups, either because the solvent is really tightly interacting with itself or the solute is really tightly interacting with itself, then a solution will not form. So this is a sort of thermodynamic way to think about how solutions form. And we could think about it this way. The, solute, the solvent solvent and the solute solute get paid back by the solute solvent. And this is one where it's negative, so this is one where this can form. If it's not, then the solvent solute interactions are not dominant, so the solution doesn't end up forming. So here we look at two organic molecules, and they ask which one might be more soluble in water. We can look at a structure. We look for a part that kind of looks like water here on the end. Again, if you're familiar with the structure of alcohols, you may know a little bit about this, but if not, that's also okay. We just see that there's oxygen here and hydrogen, and this can make this side more polar in terms of our basic understanding of structures. So it's likely this dissolves better in water than the top one. And that's really what we're looking for, something like water. And that goes with the like dissolves like rule that we've talked about. We want to look for something polar, something that looks kind of like water. This part here kind of looks like water um, in order to justify why that dissolves better in water. And that's the extent to which I'd have you do any kind of analysis of structures at this point. I'm, I'm really just looking for basic identification. Are these kind of similar? If they're similar, they probably dissolve in each other. I'm not looking for any really significant depth here. So here we're going to talk about molarity. Now you may have already heard about this. We may have already discussed this in a previous lecture. But again, this is here partially for a review um, for classes where you may not have heard as much about it. So, Moles of solute over liters of solution forms the unit molarity. Now, how does this basically work? We can convert some grams of some solute into moles and put it over the total liters. Now, this total liters is a total volume. It is not just liters of solvent. It is the total volume. And that's important because when you use like a volumetric uh, flask to measure things out right, typically you'll add your solute in and then fill it with water to dissolve all the way up. So the volume combined is what's in the flask. So this is designed this way so that you can actually create, nicely create certain concentrations of solutions with a volumetric flask, where you put your solute in and then you fill it with water or whatever solvent you want up to a certain point. Sometimes you add the, sol the solute in later, depending on how evenly you want to make sure things are mixed. There's different mixing protocols for different things. Not going to delve into the details here, but just to understand that, that the reason for this being liters of solution has to do with the practical realities of working in a lab and measuring things out and using volumetric glassware. Um, technically, you can also set up ratios, and we'll look at other units of concentration that do this, that look at this in terms of the, just the solvent by itself. But know that molarity is liters of the total solution such that the volume contributed by the solute is accounted for naturally in molarity. Usually, if we're talking about small, so like dilute amount, um, dilute solutions with small amounts of solute added to water where everything dissolves neatly and forms true solutions, the additive volume is not very much. So this, this doesn't end up really mattering significantly, but it is actually in here, right? So again, we get moles. So this is a way to measure concentration, right? So how does, how does concentration end up making sense, right? Like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get a sense of the relationship between the solute and the, the solvent, or in this case, the overall solution. And that's really what concentration is all about, right? 
They talk about some advantages, right? Stoichiometric calculations are simple because we can just use moles rather than mass. It makes it easy to compare um, relative concentrations to without worrying about the, the mass of each particular compound. We know that if we had like a one molar solution of different compounds, they're relatively similar in their concentration of particles. And that's going to be important when we talk about colligative properties, as long as the, the whole thing stays together, like it doesn't break apart into ions or something, then they'll be relatively similar in their amount of particles. Um, not necessarily though in the, in the added mass, right? Because the mass may be different. Amounts of solution, therefore solute, are conveniently measured by volume mixing rather than mass. And that's two, that's about using the volumetric flask. Disadvantages are also twofold. The exact solution concentration depends on the temperature. So that's another problem with molarity. Molarities are generally standardized at 25 degrees Celsius because the volume of water changes slightly or other solvents also change slightly with temperature changes. Um, as long as you're far away from the boiling point of the liquid that you use, if you're using a liquid here, it, it tends to be relatively um, small, this volume change. But if you're near a boiling point or freezing point, these can become really uh, silly and nonlinear. The volumes can, can change dramatically with temperature. The exact amount of solvent in a given volume can't be determined unless the density is known. This is also true for molarities as well. Mole fraction. So another way to measure concentration is to just put moles of the component, which is typically here the solute, over the total moles making up the solution. Now sometimes we'll see some equations as we're working through this chapter that use the mole fraction solvent instead of the mole fraction solute, where they'll put moles of solvent over the total moles. We'll see that that comes up in some places, but this can also be done in terms of mole fraction solute. Typically they will write that, they'll call it the mole fraction solvent or the mole fraction solute in order to distinguish those because they do both have important applications mathematically. These mole fractions are independent of temperature and they're essentially a ratio of moles of whichever component over the total moles of the entire solution. Okay, and the other thing about this is it ends up being unitless, which may also be really unit, it may, may be really useful. That's what they say here, mole fractions are dimensionless. That's another way of saying unitless. Mass percent, now these are common on labels. These are common on products that are sold and how things are actually um, put together for market. They'll put the mass of some component over the total mass of the solution times some 100%. So for example, if they have 10 grams of glucose and 100 grams of water, it'll be 10 over 10 plus 100 to get a 9.09% .09 by mass. They can also do percents by volume, which work the same way, except instead of masses, they use volumes. Typically, because these are, they'll cancel out, but typically people use milliliters, um, but milliliters will all cancel out this percent by volume. Um, it, like you see, the grams cancel out too. So. Um, this is also related to the part per million and part per billion units. So here we'll just take a mass of a component times the total mass and they'll multiply it by a million, 10 to the six, or a billion, 10 to the nine. These are sometimes used again on labeling for very small concentrations as a way to get a sense, but they're very closely related to the mass percent. So if you understand how mass percent works, you can also understand how parts per million and parts per billion work. The advantage of using these parts per million or parts per billion or mass percent is that these are again independent of temperature because these masses don't, don't change when substances are heated or cooled, but they can be less convenient when working with liquids. Um, but you can do these as percents by volume, just to be clear. It is actually possible to, to do these, but it will be called percent by volume instead of mass percent or percent by mass. So mass percent, they say I have a 5.75 mass percent solution of lithium chloride in water. What mass of solution in grams contains this much? Okay, so I take my percentage here, okay, and since I need to get grams, I'm gonna have to rewrite this percentage as grams of solution and grams of solute. So 5.75 over 100, and then I need to make sure I cancel this out because I have lithium chloride. So I need to convert from grams lithium chloride to grams solution. So they flip that ratio over here and then they end up with 27.8 grams of solution. Again, doing problems like this, you'll wanna follow up with how I've shown you to, to do, use the Google calculator or follow along with your calculator to see if you can get numbers like this. Um, but where am I getting this conversion factor? I'm getting it from the percentage because it's 5.75 over 100, right? That's what percent means. 
I have to flip it upside down though so I can convert from grams of the solute to grams of the solution. But other than that, it's, it's a pretty straightforward usage of a percentage. Using density to convert mass percent to molarity. Now this is going to be important. There's going to be homework questions that will work kind of like this. So density of a 25.0 mass percent solution of sulfuric acid in water, they give me a density. They want the molarity. Okay, so I can rewrite this mass percentage, remember, as 25 grams of sulfuric acid over 100 grams of the entire solution. I have the density of the solution, and they told me the density here was 1.183 grams per milliliter. So I'll need to convert these grams first. See down here, this, I, might, I might start with this step and start with this 100 grams of solution and convert it to get liters here. I actually think this might be the easier one to start with if you focus on this, but it actually doesn't matter which order you do them in. If you want to convert your 25 grams to moles, you're going to have to do that, okay? And then you're going to have to convert your 100 grams of solution, the second part of this setup, into um, milliliters or liters depending on what, how the density here is written. Remember that molarity has to be moles over liters, so you'll eventually want to use liters in this molarity down here. And then you can take the moles that you convert to, remember, you divide grams by, mole, by the molar mass to get moles. So grams get divided in order to get moles, and you'll put those moles over these liters to get a molarity. So it's the basic step process that we want to use. Remember, you've got grams, you've got to divide it by the molar mass. I get this molar mass off the periodic table by adding up the mass of two hydrogens, a sulfur, and four oxygens. Just to remember the basics of how we're doing this. So now we get to molality. Now, what, what is going on with this molality? It sounds a lot like molarity, but it's like they spelled it wrong. No, this is just a different unit. So it's very similar to molarity, except that it is a mass of solvent in kilograms. Now, what's interesting about this is that a kilogram of water, remember that a gram of water is about a milliliter, like, and vice versa? Well, then a kilogram of water is about a liter. So molality and molarity are very close numerically when you have dilute solutions in water, where water is the solvent, and you have a solution that forms, everything dissolves, there's no, there's no basic problems. These come to about the same number. These do vary considerably, molarity and molality, when you use solvents other than water where that density relationship, like a kilogram to a liter, does not exist. But bear in mind that you will often get very similar numbers if you do molality and to molarity. And you'll see some books and some examples where they'll use molarity or molality in certain equations because as long as you're in water, the difference is minor. But What's key is that molality is much more useful when you're in solutions, um, you're in um, solvents other than water, other than water. It's where you'll generally find the biggest difference. Or you have really, really concentrated solutions in water because molality is more directly connected to the overall activity of the system than molarity is because you'll get density changes and other things that'll, that'll mess up your molarities. But this, this will have a good relationship, right? It's temperature independent and it doesn't change. So again, this is often used if you have to keep temperature independence for a water solution or you have very concentrated solutions. But most of the time at room temperature, molarity and molality will be the same for dilute aqueous solutions. So keep that in mind. So advantages of using molality is that the amount of substance must be measured by mass rather by volume and the density must be known, right? Again, approximate densities, we see an equivalence. Okay, and they give us a little table here to remind us of these different units um, for concentration. You want to make sure you know how to calculate all of these and do interconversions between them using the basic approaches that we've reviewed up to this point. Calculating molality of the solution. So we've got grams of table sugar and we've got milliliters of water. They got the molar mass of the sugar they gave it to us, so we want to convert grams to moles, get a mole number. And then the density of water at room temperature, again, I'm going to assume that because they didn't tell me a temperature up here, is going to be one gram per milliliter or one kilogram per liter. So I can convert the 30 milliliters to 30 grams and then 
divide that by a thousand and get kilograms. So basically this molality is being calculated the same as if this was a, was a molarity, assuming that this sugar did not have any significant impact on the density of the solution. You know, as long as the solutions are dilute, this, this is generally true. And this is the symbol for molality. It's the italics, little lowercase m, as opposed to the big capital M of molarity. So they say here to convert from molality to molarity, they give me the substance ethylene glycol. They give me the density at 20 degrees Celsius of this solution in water is this. What is the molarity? The molar mass of ethylene glycol is this. Okay, so we, we can figure out from this that this is the number of moles, okay, but they want us to get the molarity. Now, I'm not sure why they, uh, why they broke this down. They said to use to dissolve this most, the mass of ethylene glycol. We could use this, to, they use this to figure out the mass of the solution overall and then convert that into a, den, use the density to get this converted. Now, you will see that you could probably get a pretty close answer by taking these moles and just looking at the, because um, this is going to end up not being a whole lot. So let's see. So when they when they end up converting this, right, you can see that the molality is 4.028 and the molarity is 3.299. They are not that far apart, like cosmically, but because there's a lot of this ethylene glycol, this is like a four. This is a four molal solution. That's that's not exactly dilute. And this does have a bigger impact on density than a lot of uh, uh, solids do that dissolve into a liquid. So we can see how there is an impact, but they're not dramatically different. Even given this situation, they're not dramatically different. So they convert this into grams, they add this to the overall mass of the solution, and then they convert that into a volume using the density and get that this is not gonna be one liter, but instead 1.221 liters. This is the kicker here. This is where things get changed. And we can get these moles back from the original uh, problem and put them over these new leaders we found and get an answer. But you can see that, like I said, they're not dramatically different. And this is a fairly concentrated solution of a liquid that does have a substantial impact on the, on the density of the liquid. So. so molarity to other measures, right? Molarity is often a common unit you'll see. So how do we convert these to different units? This gives us a quick way, like an approach to work out any of these different conversions. The kicker usually will be to first get the moles, okay, and assume they're over some volume of solution, right? You're gonna get that first. And then if you need to convert it to other units, you know, they say we'll just get these into grams and then get the mass of the solution itself, right? And if we wanna get this into a mole fraction, then we'll need to figure out how many moles of water this ends up being, right? And they end up using this component of the solution and subtract the grams from this total kilograms and convert these into moles. So you get the kilograms of water here again, which you'll need to use for the, for the molality. You'll use those down here for C. So you could actually solve C as one of the easiest ones. And then use the two moles that you were able to convert to to get a mole fraction. And then the two masses that you got up here to get a mass percent. So essentially, you'll take the molarity, get the, first you get the moles of the solute, convert that to a mass, get the mass of the overall solution from the density that they provided, then take the difference between them to get the mass of water, you can convert that to moles, and from there you'll have all the information that you need to do all three conversions. They do all this setup here at the very beginning, but you end up using different parts of it for different steps, like on a problem. You may not have to do all of these. Factors that affect solubility, right? So without going into too much detail about the concepts of equilibrium, which will be discussed further in 152, we see that a solute in solvent can dissolve to form a solution, or if the solution is saturated, it will crystallize back out. Because a solvent has a certain carrying capacity for a given solute at a given temperature. So this Things dissolve and crystallize out if there's any at the bottom. If we've got a saturated solution, this kind of setup will happen. Now, sometimes you can get super saturated solutions because sometimes this process needs a little activation energy to go from being dissolved to crystallizing out. And so you might 
you might be able to hold something in a situation where it's not actually able to get back to its 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 lowest energy state, its sort of its equilibrium position, um, until it's been disturbed. They talk here about a little bit about seed crystallization for that. So temperature and solubility most of the time for liquids and liquids and solids in liquids, a higher temperature increases the solubility most of the time. That's a most of the time thing. We'll see that you can see most of these curves go up with increasing temperature. Some of them are basically straight line and it has no real impact. A few of them go down, but most of the time it goes up. That's a most of the time thing. I said, back of the envelope, I assume that that's true. The exact relationship is complex and nonlinear, but that's generally true for solids and liquids and liquids and liquids. That's generally true. It's not true for gases. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. In, with gases, gases become less soluble in liquids. They say in water, but it's generally true in all liquids. Gases tend to become less soluble in liquids as the temperature increases. This, this is a result of the faster moving liquid particles tending to push the gas together into bubbles. There's more complexity to it, but that's something we can imagine, right? A consequence of this in, in real life is like a carbonated drink, right? If I heat that up, it can explode because all the gas can come out quickly from the dissolved, um, that's dissolved in the liquid. Um, also, if they're stored in a hot place, they'll go flat faster. These are all consequences of the solubility of gases in liquids. A more important consequence is the damage to aquatic life that can result from a decrease in concentration of dissolved oxygen when hot water is discharged from industrial plants, an effect known as thermal pollution. So it's just hot water, you'd think it'd be okay. But when the hot water runs into lakes and rivers and, and other kinds of bodies of water where living things are, are trying to survive, uh, it can kill all the fish because hot water cannot dissolve oxygen as easily as cold water can. And that can make a big difference. That can make a big difference. Now, this is of course really scaled up, right? Say most gases become less soluble in water as the temperature rises, okay? Oxygen, it's a more of a shallow curve, we see this, but it can be enough to kill fish. Nitrogen as well is more shallow, but depending on the gas, some gases interact differently with liquids and they have different curves, but the general idea is still true that the solubility tends to go down and remain about flat after some point, but generally going down as temperature increases for gases in liquids. This can be quantified with Henry's law, which describes the solubility of a gas in a liquid at a given temperature and says it's directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas over the solution, right? So the Henry's law constant, this is set at a given temperature. So what this will calculate is the solubility of a gas in a liquid given the pressure that sits above it of that gas. So if I have like a, like a cup of water on the table, then this partial pressure is the partial pressure of oxygen over it. Now partial pressure is that contributed pressure that is that gas I'm trying to look at. So it's, it's about, you know, the, the concentration of oxygen, you know, it's about 21%. So it's about a, a fifth, of the, fifth to a fourth of the concentration of the, the pressure of the air itself. Doubling the partial pressure doubles the solubility. So the more pressure I put on it, the more it dissolves. That's how they carbonate beverages too. They put a lot of partial pressure over it during the canning process, somewhere often between five and 10 atmospheres and the gas dissolves quickly into the liquid and then they seal it so it stays at that pressure. When you open it, it releases the pressure and then the fizziness comes out. Like that's the basic thought. So carbonated beverages follow Henry's law, at least to some extent, right? Also, this can be life-threatening if you have com deep sea compression. So as you go at pressure, as pressure is put on your body by going underwater, more gas dissolves into your blood, especially nitrogen which has no way to chemically dissolve. The nitrogen's inert in your blood. So its solubility is driven by Henry's law. It's not true for oxygen and carbon dioxide, which have mediators in your blood to exchange those. So more of it can dissolve than Henry's law predicts and other stuff. But nitrogen essentially works close to Henry's law. And if you ascend quickly or pressure changes too quickly, bubbles can form in your blood from the nitrogen and that can block up arteries and that can kill you. They call this the bends, um, but that's another consequence of Henry's law. On a molecular level, the increase in gas solubility with increasing pressure occurs due to a change in position of equilibrium. Again, we're not gonna dissolve, discuss this equilibrium concept in too much depth here, but if we put pressure on the system, then 
we're going to push more particles in. We can think about it like that. When we relieve the pressure, the gas can then escape from liquid. Gas wants to be gas. Some of it wants to interact with the liquid, but that relationship with the liquid depends on the particular gas and the particular liquid, how friendly they are with each other, right? And that's the Henry's Law constant. This K is the friendliness. We can think about this as like the friendliness constant. How friendly is this gas with this liquid? It's quantified by this K parameter, which is related to both the liquid, the, the, the solvent, and the solute, the gas and the, um, and the liquid. So they say this is the Henry's Law constant, and this would be for methyl bromide in water at 25 degrees Celsius. So all those have to be set in this constant to be aware. Those are all moving variables that are set by the constant itself. And these have to be provided to you in a problem, or you'd have to look them up in a table, because these are empirically measured, the Henry's Law constant. That's what they call this, this K value. There, you'll see a little K show up other places and in other points in especially 152, but in this context, it's the Henry's Law constant. So we multiply that by the partial pressure, and that's all we have to do. So we can keep that pretty simple, right? Now, the Henry's Law constant is in moles per liter per atmosphere. So if our pressure is given in millimeters of mercury, we'll need to convert that into atmospheres by dividing by 760. And this is the same thing we would do in an ideal gas law situation. So if you've taken an, if you've seen ideal gas law material before, you'd know this conversion factor, as it is one of the ones that you need to memorize to do ideal gas law problems. So it's pretty straightforward. We convert the millimeters of mercury into atmospheres, and then we multiply that value by the Henry's Law constant, and we get a solubility in moles per liter, which is a molarity. We get a molarity out of this, and that is the solubility as a molarity, the maximum amount that will, that will dissolve. All right, so let's talk briefly here about colligative properties. So colligative properties are those properties of a solution that depend only on the amount of particles, but not on their identity. And again, this only applies to solutions that behave correctly, that behave ideally. And we'll talk a little bit about more about what that means, but here are the basic points of colligative properties. Vapor pressure, boiling point, freezing point, and osmosis. These, param these things are controlled by colligative properties, these effects. Vapor pressures of solutions are lower because the added solute tends to hold on to the solvent and prevent it from escaping. That also raises the boiling point. The vapor pressure and the boiling point are kind of just two ways of saying the same thing. A lower vapor pressure means a higher boiling point inherently. So these two parameters must both be the same. Also, the freezing points are lower because the added solute tends to prevent the solvent from, fr from getting into a good arrangement to freeze because there's all the solute in the way. So that tends to make it harder to freeze, so it freezes at a lower temperature. So in effect, the liquid range of a solution is extended by the presence of the solute, so it stays liquid over a wider range of temperature. In addition, there's osmosis. Solvent moves through a semi-permeable membrane to go from an area of lower solute concentration to an area of higher to try to bring the system to one concentration as best as it can. Concentrated solutions can be thought of as more unstable or at a higher energy state. So the systems try to make them less concentrated. That is, that is a thermodynamic drive of systems to lower their energy, disperse their energy by becoming more dilute. And we'll see that no matter how we set up things, whether it's a, an osmosis or reverse osmosis, that effect is always the same. Okay. All right. So that is the end of this first presentation on Chapter 11, and I hope to see you all in the next one. Thanks.